explore and discuss in connection with The Gods, a user's guide exhibition, which I hope all of you have had a chance to visit or surely will visit after this debate. Cette conférence, la première de quatre, s'inscrit dans le cadre de l'exposition Dieu, mode d'emploi, que vous avez peut-être eu la chance de visiter. This evening, we are hosting a panel of experts in exploring the topic of multiculturalism in Canada, secularism, and reasonable accommodation. We are extremely fortunate to have very knowledgeable experts in the field of reasonable accommodation. First, tonight, we will hear from Dr. Lori Beeman from the University of Ottawa, who is also the project director of the Religion and Diversity Project, with whom the Museum of Civilization is partnering for this event. Later on this evening, we will hear different points of view on this interesting subject from Dr. Solange Lefebvre, who is the Chair of Religion, Culture and Society at the University of Montréal and was an expert on the Bouchard Taylor Commission in Quebec. She will be followed by Professor Natasha Bant, a law professor from the University of Ottawa, who examines Sharia law in Ontario, veiling and faith-based arbitration. And notre dernier conférencier ce soir sera le Dr. Charles Taylor de l'Université McGill, Vous le connaissez sans doute puisqu'il était le Monsieur Taylor de la Commission Bouchard Taylor, la Commission de consultation sur les pratiques d'accommodement reliées aux différences culturelles et sur la Commission sur les accommodements raisonnables. We are very excited to hear our presenters this evening, which will unfold as follows. First, we will hear up to 10 minutes from each panelist as they explain their area of expertise and their findings. Next, we will have a roundtable discussion on some key areas that have been debated in the media and around water coolers across the country. And then, that's where you play a role, we hope to hear from you, the audience. We have microphones set up in the audience, and the panelists will be happy to address your questions at the end of the debates. Après les allocutions de nos invités, qui dureront environ 10 minutes chacune, nous discuterons ensemble selon le format d'une table ronde, et puis ce sera votre tour de poser une question en lien avec le sujet, si vous le désirez, il y a des micros de chaque côté de la salle ici, et on vous demanderait bien sûr, lorsque ce sera temps, de bien sûr aller au micro pour poser votre question. Et je vous invite bien sûr à poser votre question dans l'une ou l'autre des langues officielles, puisque bien sûr, nos panélistes ont aussi accès à l'interprétation simultanée. On this note, our first presenter tonight is Dr. Lori Beeman from the University of Ottawa. She holds the Canada Research Chair in the Contextualization of Religion in a Diverse Canada. Over the past 10 years, Dr. Beeman has focused her research on reasonable accommodation and multiculturalism in Canada. One of the questions she asks is, are tolerance and accommodation the best we can do in a nation that prides itself on multiculturalism? Please welcome Dr. Lori Beeman. Pleasure to be here this evening. Thank you all for coming. I'd like to begin by just a couple of quick thank yous. First is a special thank you to Dr. Heather Shipley, who's sitting right down there. She's the project manager for the Religion and Diversity Project, and she's worked extensively with the museum to help to coordinate this panel, these this series of panels. So thank you very much, Heather. And also a thanks to the Museum of Civilization for partnering with us and uh, being brave enough to bring these discussions into the public sphere, if you will, and opening this up for discussion. Uh, it's not an easy thing to put together an exhibition on God's, uh, nor is it an easy thing, I think, to invite the public in and invite debate. So very much appreciated and, and a great deal of thanks to the Museum of Civilization. Um, so I, I'm also grateful, I should say, to sit on a panel with people whose work has been so helpful in helping me think through issues around diversity, multiculturalism, religious freedom, and so on and so forth. And I started thinking about what is it that we're all doing here. And I think we're all engaged in a common project. And the common project is that even though we're based in the Canadian context to some extent, each of us, and I know the work of my co-panelists quite well, each of us thinks outside of the Canadian context to bring other contexts into conversation with Canada and what we're doing here in order to think about what it is that we are doing, what about it is valuable, what about it might be improved, and so on and so forth. So it's a common endeavor that we share as we think about how is it that we're going to work through this thing, improve this thing um, called multiculturalism, and work through, especially because my work is focused on religious diversity, thinking about how to manage or work through or negotiate religious diversity. And all of these terms are quite loaded, and I'm well aware of that. 
I'm thinking, for example, about how to rights and should they be allowed to not have their photographs on driver's licenses. I'm thinking about how kosher and halal food makes it into kindergartens. I'm thinking about wearing of niqab in criminal court and in the streets. Uh, I'm thinking about the kirpan and wearing the kirpan in the streets or wearing it into the National Assembly. Um, I'm thinking about turbans for Sikhs and whether Sikhs should be allowed exemptions, so-called exemptions, uh, if they're riding a motorcycle, for example, and so on and so forth. My research has focused in the last, it has a fairly wide basis. I started my research career um, thinking about evangelical Christians and violence against women on the East Coast. I moved to the West, and there I studied Latter-day Saints, and I worked with Latter-day Saints. Um, I've done some work in Ottawa with Peter Beyer on, Hindu, on Hindus, Muslims, and Buddhists and looking at how they're managing diversity or negotiating diversity and so on. So in the short time that I have tonight, I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about the, the language of tolerance and accommodation and tell you that I'm worried about that. I'm worried about the way that the language of tolerance and accommodation <coughs> seems to be infiltrating public debates as well as to some extent law when we're talking about religious diversity and the negotiation of religious diversity. And some people are quite surprised when I say I'm worried about that. And I'll try to explain to you a little bit about why it is I'm worried about it. So my, my research has been partly at looking at case law. I have training as a lawyer, but I think of myself more as a sociologist bringing a critical sociological lens to law. So I like to examine case law outside of the framework of law. And it means I can do some tricky things that people who are working in the realm of law sometimes can't do. Although certainly I would say the work of Natasha Bach, who you'll hear shortly, um, would suggest that she too works outside the strict domain of law or the legal framework. So I want to talk quickly about the problem with accommodation and tolerance. I want to talk about the idea of reconstituting the notion of equality. Uh, and I don't mean formal equality when I talk about equality. And then I want to talk about how that might happen in what probably six minutes that's left, if that. So first of all, what's wrong with tolerance and accommodation? Briefly, in a nutshell, it creates a hierarchy. And it creates a hierarchy such that we tolerate them or we accommodate them. And I think that's very problematic for a number of reasons. In 1689, John Locke writes in his A Letter Concerning Toleration, he's kind of identified as the person who begins all this tolerance talk. He advocates for toleration. He says it's a good thing. And then he says, except for atheists and Roman Catholics. And that's exactly the problem with tolerance, is that we can start making exceptions. We should tolerate but, there's, or there's too much tolerance, and so on and so forth. I think that accommodation does the same kind of thing. It establishes a hierarchy, and then we can start talking about too much accommodation. Rather than thinking about equality and perhaps reconstituting or reshaping equality in a different way. So tolerance creates a language or allows for the possibility of a language of exceptionalism. In other words, in the Hutterian Brethren decision, which is the case that I mentioned briefly, when the Hutterites were looking for an exemption from having their photographs placed on their driver's licenses. Uh, this was based on their religious beliefs. They said we should be exempt, 250 Hutterites uh, in Alberta. And they asked to not have to have their driver's license photographs on their driver's license. And the court and society has framed this as an exception. And I think this is partly because we think about, we think in terms of tolerance and accommodation rather than equality and thinking about ways that equality could be facilitated. Equality has its own problems, but um, I'll go quickly to too much the idea of accommodation. So accommodation has two provenances. One is in law. I wave my hands too much and then I make too much noise here. One is in law and the other has be, become a, a way to talk about religious diversity in public discourse. In law, it starts in disability law, migrates into employment law, and employers have a duty to accommodate. So for example, if they have an employee who needs a day off um, other than, for example, the common day of rest that happens to exist in a particular business, the, the employer has a duty to accommodate so long as it doesn't cause undue hardship. So this is a duty that existed in employment law, and then it starts to migrate, and the language of reasonable accommodation starts to migrate through law a little bit into other sorts of cases. So the Kirpan, what's known as the Kirpan case, uh, which is the Multani case, a young schoolboy, Sikh schoolboy wants 
wants to wear his ceremonial dagger to school. Um, the language of accommodation starts to migrate into that. Just shortly after that, we have the Quebec government calling the Bouchard-Taylor Commission. And um, we have the commission take place, lots of hearings, lots of public submissions. And in the report that's produced from that, the authors specifically try to delimit reasonable accommodation into the legal realm. And I'm not sure that they're especially successful. But what happens as a result of that is the language of accommodation becomes part of our public discourse. And again, I think it creates a hierarchy. Um, oh, three minutes? Okay. A hierarchy uh, that really doesn't facilitate thinking about religious diversity in an especially productive way. So what do I propose instead? First of all, I think that I can propose this because we're working in the Canadian context. When I suggested in the European context that the language of tolerance and accommodation be ab abandoned, I, I met with gasps of horror because as, as one of the authors of the Belgian report that's similar to the Bouchard-Taylor Commission report has said to me, We've been struggling to even get to the place of accommodation for a long time. And accommodation, in, in our view, is a good thing. But I think in the Canadian context, because of our history of multiculturalism, because of our history of equality uh, in a substantive and not a formal way, um, I think that we're better placed, we're well placed, uh, our, our uh, policies and our demographic around multiculturalism. So I propose that we think about equality in a different way, and I've developed this concept called deep equality, which may just be a sociologist's tendency to invent new words. We love to do that. But deep equality, it seems to me, requires something beyond formal equality, and it, it needs to exist outside of law. We do need law as a beacon, as a way to say these are your rights and responsibilities, but we also need people on the ground thinking about how to treat each other as equals and how to negotiate as equals. It all sounds rather airy-fairy and quite theoretical, I'm sure. Uh, but it's what I've been thinking about, and I started to think, well, how do we get to this thing? We don't just invent it. We don't just say, well, this is what deep equality is. And here it is, I think, that what I'm working on kind of maps a little bit onto what the Bouchard-Taylor Commission report actually found, which was that People work things out on their own, but one of the things that seems to me to be missing are the positive narratives about how people negotiate religious diversity. So how do people on a day-to-day -day basis work it out? And I was just talking before we started about the, the example of the Cabana Sucre in the uh, Bouchard-Taylor Commission report. Once that story gets unpacked, so the story is basically reported that a bunch of Muslims go and they take over a maple sugar camp, and you know the sacred maple sugar camp symbol. I'm from a long line of maple sugar makers, so I'm not making fun. Um, so they take over the camp. When the story is unpacked, what ha has happened, as it turns out, is a group of Muslims want to see, well, what's this thing about? What's the fuss about all the maple sugar? So they negotiate beans with no pork. They negotiate prayer space. But the way it's reported in the media is something completely different. And that's the kind of story, so my time is up, that's the kind of story that we need to recover on a more systematic basis in order to think about how is it that deep equality or equality can be imagined? In other words, based on the experiences of real people. I'm going to end with um, something that Anne Solomon, who's a First Nations woman who gave a presentation at the Ontario Human Rights Consultation on Creed, get, she said a couple of weeks ago. And she said, let the people drive the policy, not the policy drive the people. And what she meant by that is, let's take people's stories seriously about how they negotiate difference in day-to-day -day life. Thank you very much.